he wasn't there yet, but the Beatles were mm -hmm. looking for a photo op. And I think that day in February 1964 was really right. me, the Beatles, and Cassius Clay. <laughs> that was the beginning of the 60s. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Robert Lipsight. He's a legendary, widely acclaimed sports writer, novelist, and now he's going to be ESPN's new ombudsman uh, come June 1st. Bob, thanks for talking to us. My pleasure. Uh, you As know, an I, old Reason subscriber, <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. I wrote recently when I read about you becoming mm. uh, ESPN's ombudsman that uh, chances are people have read something that mm. you've written, whether they like sports or hate sports, because... Uh, you know, for the past 45 or 50 years, I mean, you've been writing really insightful and wide-ranging essays about sports, young mm -hmm. adult novels. My personal favorite is The Contender, which I was forced to read, and it was one of those books that made me understand required reading isn't always terrible. Other people love One Fat Summer. Uh, let's talk first about um, ESPN, your role as ombudsman. What will you be, uh, what will you be doing? Well, that's a very good question. Any suggestions yeah. you have oh. are, are welcome. Uh, I'm the fifth one. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone before has done it entirely differently. I suspect that I will do it the same way I, I wrote sports columns and city columns. You do some reporting and then out of that emerges a take. Right. Now, will you be taking cues? I mean, will it be your interest or will it be reader interest? Well, mostly? ultimately, uh, I'll have to be interested. Yeah. But uh, I, the, the first pass really will come out of the email bag mm -hmm. and see what, what people uh, are interested in. That's always dangerous, of course, mm -hmm. because they're mostly complaining about something. Uh, but maybe there's something to complain about. What are your main areas of interest in contemporary sports uh, kind of culture right now? What, do you, what, are, what well, draws you? I mean, ESPN is Im very important mm -hmm. because for most people, I think it's the main window onto sports and sports culture. Sure. And we, we probably agree that sports is important yeah. as a definer of values. Right. All the years that I have uh, written witheringly mm -hmm. about ESPN, for which I've also worked, right. I must say, uh, it's, it's been the conflict of interest, wondering how you deal with that interface where you are fiduciary partners in the game right. and then you are supposedly covering it in any kind of honest journalistic way. How do, how do you think ESPN has been doing? Is this a necessary conflict? Um, and are they doing a pretty good job well, of sure, policing Well, sure, it's a necessary themselves? conflict if yeah. they're going to have uh, any kind of journalism presence, right. which is probably a good thing for them to have. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I probably would, you know, trash ESPN. Uh, now that they're paying A couple you. of weeks from, no, <laughs> no, no. Uh, yeah. What I realize now is that I, all these years, haven't had access. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not giving me subpoena power, as right. far as I know, but I, I believe that anybody at ESPN who doesn't answer my call, it's a guilty plea. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I hope to get to the mm -hmm. bottom of it. I mean, a very good example, in, you know, before my watch, of course, is Jason Collins right. uh, comes out. And okay, today. and this is the NBA player who is, I guess, the first more or less active player in right. a professional sports league male to come out as gay. Right. And one of their prime NBA reporters, mm -hmm. um, in discussing it a couple of days later, said that uh, homosexuals are walking in open rebellion to God and mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. He's also against uh, premarital sex, right. any kind of sex, right. unless it's between a married man and a woman. The basic question is, was he led into that statement on an ESPN show where he was asked what his personal mm -hmm. views were? Was it a declaration uh, and a white paper? Why would that matter? Uh, I think it would matter uh, a lot. I yeah. don't know, uh, certainly in, in any kind of standards mm -hmm. and practices, does a reporter mm -hmm. uh, have the privilege mm -hmm. uh, of an opinion about something that we expect he's covering whatever right. objectively means. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it would matter. If and, he was a columnist, right. it wouldn't matter. In trying to kind of speak to a broad audience of sportsgoers, should they have people who think that homosexuality is against God's will? 
because that would reflect part of their As long as they're or, broadcasting in America, yeah. and a big chunk right. of the population feels that way, you bet. Yeah. Freedom of speech, and I mm -hmm. think you know, people have a right to be wrong. Right. Uh, but um, the question is, within a journalistic construct, right. is that appropriate? And so you've talked about, I mean, this partly uh, you're, you're going to try and bring more transparency. I mean, that's the role of the I, I, too. I consider myself the window washer. Yeah. With ESPN as a kind of institution, do you feel, it, I always thought that in a way, I mean, early on especially, it seemed snarky, um, but that was very different and it was very refreshing in sports coverage because for a long time, I think you and a number of uh, other people were different than kind of typical sports writers mm -hmm. in that they brought some edge and some critical distance or some irony to the games or in the industries that they covered. Yeah. Do you think overall ESPN has been a positive influence on the way that we talk about well, sports? Well, you're talking about a very specific time in mm -hmm. ESPN's career when it wasn't ESPN. Right. Now we're talking about Keith Olbermann mm -hmm. and Dan Patrick in particular, right. uh, who had their own uh, Sports Center show. Right. Uh, and they had not been told that irony was over, right, uh, right. nor sarcasm or right. parody or anything like that. And they were refreshing, yeah. uh, and certainly compared to you know, most of the ex-jock, blow-haired guys on yeah. television, they were wonderful. Um, ESPN ultimately, I think, became uncomfortable with that as they became more institutionalized, right. uh, as they got into bed with the leagues. And ultimately, as we know yeah. now, um, they are probably the main uh, mm -hmm. donors for ABC and Disney. Right. So um, that no longer exists. Mm -hmm. uh, was ESPN a positive force? Well, let's take a step back. Mm -hmm. Is sports a positive mm -hmm. force in America? Sometimes it is and sometimes right. it's not. Uh, I guess a lot of the sports that ESPN and the other networks cover uh, is, is not a positive force right. any more than any other kind of entertainment. Right. This is two levels of sports in America. Mm -hmm. One is, of course, celebrity sports, and the other is uh, what you do with your body in public. Right. Uh, where do you go now for good sports writing? What, what are your favorite uh, writers or places, sites? I, I think that there's more good sports writing mm -hmm. than there's ever been, more smart, intelligent people. The only person, however, who I never fail to read is Dave Zirin. Mm -hmm. I think that he's brought something absolutely new and fresh and to sports writing. And he is the, uh, bizarrely, is, the sports editor of the uh, well, he's of more, the nation. Of the nation, so, yeah. Right. I mean, so, that, that's well, what do you part. like? What what's he bringing? That well, is, every uh, everything uh, is politically based. Right. I don't. I, he he covers nothing without giving us. It's, uh, it's political right. ramifications and antecedents. And, uh, in, in that sense, I think he could be seen as a kind of protege of you or an epigon of, of yours. I would like to think yeah. so. Um, well, because he's, this... He's much smarter and stronger <laughs> in, in those areas than I ever yeah. was. But I, I would like to take a piece yeah, of it. Well, I mean, one of the things that you did early on in a way that was kind of unannounced uh, and thankfully gained a wide mm -hmm. readership, but that you, you were talking to me before about sports, you know, has multiple levels, but you didn't treat sports as a world unto itself. It's really important as a kind of reflector of American culture, and it creates a feedback loop where with what happens in sports affects us mm -hmm. in, throughout culture, politics, you name it, business and vice versa. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, Reason is in its 45th year of existence. We started in 1968 by a yeah. guy who I believe- And I don't read you for your sports coverage. That's right. Uh, that's probably a wise, uh, a wise decision. Uh, you know, set the scene for us in the you know, mid 60s uh, when you started sports writing. What was the expectation when, when people looked at sports and when people read about sports, what were they after? What were they interested in? The, the, the quintessential event where I also believe the 60s began mm -hmm. was Muhammad Ali fighting Sonny Liston, mm -hmm. the heavyweight championship. Um, here was a 22-year-old boxer, never beaten anybody mm -hmm. of note, had no reason in the world to be fighting the heavyweight champion, uh, but Boxing needed a sacrificial version right. for the box office. And he had even, wasn't even a true heavyweight, really, at that point, or he had just bumped up. Well, he had, he had won the light heavyweight right. title in, in the Olympics in 60. Right. He, he had been on the cover of Time magazine mm -hmm. when that meant right. something, but that was only because of the bad poetry mm -hmm. that he didn't even write 
that he was reading right. in coffee houses. So um, here he comes uh, to fight the heavyweight championship, seven to one odds. Right. And Sonny Liston, I mean, for those of us, uh, or for our viewers who don't remember who Sonny Liston is, uh, who was Sonny Liston? Sonny, Sonny Liston was, was Grendel's mother. Yeah. Sonny Liston was the unbeatable mm -hmm. thug. He'd come out of prison uh, to knock everybody out. Mm -hmm. uh, the NAAC begged uh, other black fighters not to fight him because it would be bad for the movement. Mm -hmm. uh, he was just kind of a, a glowering and, monster. And yeah, he was famous for not really being particularly talkative or Didn't uh, talk. glared a lot. And he, um, his, his, his fists did his talking yeah. for him. He generally knocked people out in the first round, right. which, is, which is what made my career. Mm -hmm. When Cassius Clay, as Muhammad Ali was then called, went to fight Liston, uh, the real boxing writer didn't really think it was worth right. his time. So they decided to send a kid from Night Rewrite. Mm -hmm. And that was me. And my yeah. instructions were, as soon as I got to Miami, is rent a car and drive back and forth between the, the arena where the fight was going to be held and the nearest hospital. So I would waste right. no deadline time following Cassius Clay into an intensive care, which I did. Uh, I went to his, that day, that same day, I parked and, and went to his gym where he worked out. He wasn't there yet, but the Beatles were mm -hmm. looking for a photo op. And I think that day in February 1964 was really right. me, the Beatles, and <laughs> Cassius Clay. <laughs> that was the beginning of the 60s. You know, and you're kind of, and, the old, and, you're the only one who's still got it together now, too. Well, we were all together in the same room, the, 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 the six of us. Yeah. I was the fifth Beatle. But also lurking out in the neighborhood was Malcolm X, right. who had been asked to um, keep a low profile mm -hmm. in return for two tickets to the fight mm -hmm. because the, uh, the promoter was afraid that uh, people wouldn't come if they knew that uh, Cassius Clay was uh, on his way to becoming a Muslim. Mm -hmm. When you showed up there, did you realize that this is, you know, this isn't about a boxing match. This is about a, we're about to enter a new world where Cassius Clay can reinvent himself as Muhammad Ali and, you know, the Beatles made many different oh, no, things I, possible. I was much more grandiose than that. Yeah. I thought this was a chance for me to get a uh, byline in the paper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, I was, a, I was a total right. careerist. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. this was very exciting for right. a kid off night rewrite right. to get what you know some feature stories, and um, you know the Beatles were great, yeah. and um, Ali was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Al Clay, we were about the same age. There was a real uh, age gap. Mm -hmm. Most of the reporters and columnists down there was a heavyweight fight after right. all were older men, older white mm -hmm. men. And uh, they were all in Sonny Liston's camp, right. where Joe Lewis was, mm -hmm. you know, the, the great yeah, Floyd Earl Patterson. Boxer. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, talk about that because one of the things that is fascinating, is, and especially if you come to Ali after he is, mm -hmm. you know, the heavyweight champion, the king of all kings and whatnot, it's hard to believe that sports writers weren't always falling over themselves, praising him and mm -hmm. trying to uh, kind of sniff his jock. Uh, why did sports writers? dislike Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay. So well, much. first of all, on, on the most basic yeah. level, he was an unorthodox fighter. Mm -hmm. uh, the received wisdom is that the only way to box was by slipping punches, which basically meant mm -hmm. you moved your head one side or the other and, and the punch harmlessly travels. He leaned backwards. Mm -hmm. well, obviously, he was going to get caught and get mm -hmm. knocked out, but he was so incredibly fast for a big man. Mm -hmm. He treated sports writers with not contempt, but you know, a certain familiarity, mm -hmm. which they did not like. They were you know, gentlemen of the press. They wanted mm -hmm. uh, particularly black boxers to be grateful for this opportunity to become Americans. Uh, and so in every way, he was offensive. And, and really, the point was he didn't deserve this fight right. in, in the way right. a contender moves up. It would be just a little bit later, as America is pulling apart mm -hmm. over the Vietnam War, that they pull apart over Cassius right. Clay than Muhammad Ali. But at that moment, just before he became heavyweight champion, um, he was this um, 
kind of cute kid right. who was going to get his head knocked off. And it was really sad, but yeah. it would be fun to watch. Right. Talk about Ali, because, I mean, he, he is somebody who you, over the course of your career, you've kind of intersected with at various points, and you've uh, talked He's to, been my story yeah. since 1964. Well, and how does he exemplify a kind of change in American culture and American sports culture and the way that we think about sports? Well, uh, and he's idiosyncratic, mm -hmm. because he really helped people like me who wanted to write more social and uh, political yeah. Uh, aspects of sports, uh, and so he brought all of that in. Mm -hmm. I think in 1964, people saw sports as this sanctuary, mm -hmm. and a lot of people still do, right. sanctuary from real life, uh, as this kind of this um, American campfire mm -hmm. where the whole family could come together in this really non-threatening way. I mean, mm -hmm. we could fight about you know, Mets versus Yankees right. or Red Sox, whatever. But that's kind of play boxing. Right. It, it really didn't matter. And so we didn't really have to talk mm -hmm. about the issues that we really should So we examining. didn't have to talk about race, class, or race, gender? Class. No, it, yeah. it, it and, certainly didn't exist. And we, it was a world in which women did not exist. Mm -hmm. We did not let women into the press box, mm -hmm. much less the locker room. No place for women. Right. We did not cover... Uh, women's sports. Um, I think that we were tolerant to, uh, this is mainstream right. white America, uh, tolerant to black athletes mm -hmm. as long as they hewed a certain line. And even Sonny Liston, you know, thug that he might have been, hewed that line. Right. He was the, the black boogeyman right. uh, that we had tamed. Right. You know, he's, he wasn't mugging us anymore. Right. We put gloves on him. So, so uh, he's like Mighty Joe Young or something. I mean, he's a exactly, trained, that's exactly he's a what trained he, beast. And we, we, yeah. we dragged him in from the jungle, yeah. uh, but mm -hmm. we owned him. Yeah. And so that, I mean, that helps explain why the press, as Ali got literally and figuratively more and more outspoken as he changed from Cassius Clay, the Louisville lip, into mm. this monster, like a, a black man who dared speak whatever he said. Um, I mean, that helps explain why sports writers were like, oh, my God, this, this guy's insane. They had to say that. Yeah. I mean, Well, uh, they believed it, yeah, too. I mean, right? yeah. what, if, what if Paul Robeson had become a pro football player? Right. You might have had some of the same situation. Right, right. Beyond even issues of race, um, you know, but also individuality and whatnot, I mean, it's always stunning to me. And I'm, I'm about to turn 50, and I think of the early... Ages of, I can remember people arguing about Joe Frazier versus Muhammad right. Ali, and it, only later did I realize this was a proxy. You know, mm -hmm. it was a proxy battle for the proxy battle between the Soviet Union and, mm -hmm. you know, America and Vietnam or whatever. Uh, but also people like Joe Namath and Johnny Unitas. Right. You know, it seems like a really stark contrast. And the 60s, by the mm -hmm. end of the 60s, mm -hmm. suddenly athletes went from being these kind of lantern jaw comic book mm -hmm. heroes who really didn't have much to say, but we're not threatening. And suddenly they're pulling on pantyhose like mm -hmm. Joe Namath or they're you know, openly sleeping with women and wearing Fu Manchu mm -hmm. mustaches. How much did sports help fuel a kind of individualization in American culture or is it mostly that it was representing? Well, I think uh, that when, when sports happened? opened up to the black athlete, mm -hmm. and Harry Edwards, a well-known right. sociologist, right. was really the first to say that uh, sports and then America would take on the values of the underclass because the underclass was taking over right. sports. And he, of course, engineered or, or helped orchestrate the 1968 Right, the Black, Black Power, Power salute at the 68 yeah. Olympics. In ghetto sports, mm -hmm. um, kids would wear Argyle socks mm -hmm. in track meets to show a little style. Right. They were repressed in so many ways mm -hmm. so that they would make these little movements. The whole, um, you know, quote, schoolyard basketball, mm -hmm. you know, the slam dunk, the kind of right. the flashy plays, you know, all evolved out of black neighborhoods. Right. And that eventually got institutionalized in the ABA, but right. then it was treated as a, but a early lesser on, league. But now yeah. we're talking the 60s, right. where a basketball was beginning to struggle right. between textbook and schoolyard. Right. Uh, schoolyard being what was seen as part of the rebellion of, mm -hmm. you know, college football players growing mutton chops, right. you know, 
defying uh. the coach. Now, <laughs> and you would never get away looking the way you look like now. You're off the team, Nick. That's um, right. Yeah. I mean, all these things which seem yeah. so quaint right. and almost silly now. Uh, so, uh, and then the way uh, Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay, put right. down his opponents. You know, that's trash talk. That right. trash talk is really the dozens and joning, right. which was, you know, a black uh, corner now, chatter. You, one of the things that's fascinating is for, I mean, you, you saw Muhammad Ali as, as a kind of cultural change agent, somebody much more important than whatever he oh, was doing in bet. boxing. But by the same token, and as much as he pushed against white stereotypes of blacks, he also, I mean, and I think of the way that he talked about Joe Frazier, and he ultimately apologized for it, but he actually traded in the crassest kind of racial stereotypes himself. Oh, it's worse than it? that. Uh, let's not forget yeah. that the nation of Islam right. was going up against uh, civil rights. Yeah. They believed in, they were quite open about it, they believed in segregation. Right. He also made not so cryptic comments that uh, Malcolm X got what he deserved, right? Because Malcolm well, X I'm, had I mean, that, that's, in. that's that's where um, Muhammad Ali and his current wife and I have some of our issues. I, yeah. I think that he was, in some abstract way, an accomplice in the death. When mm -hmm. when he said that anybody uh, who defies the honorable Elijah Muhammad you know, shouldn't live, right. it, that was open season. Had he um, held on mm -hmm. to Malcolm? Even after his apostasy, I think that Malcolm uh, would have lived. Mm -hmm. Why did it take black athletes, you know, say Italian athletes, uh, you know, you'd, you'd, nobody expected Joe DiMaggio to, uh, in, a, in a way he broke a color line in that he kind of transformed, or Hank Greenberg, I mean these white ethnics mm -hmm. who came through. But you don't think of them at all as ethnic now, right? Was that the price of their admission to kind of immortal status? They assimilated. Yeah. They were able to assimilate. I mean, Hank Greenberg is a, yeah. you know, he predates, of course, Sandy right. Koufax. And right. Hank Greenberg really is uh, the great Jewish jock. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet. So we're going to have to. Uh, super Jew Mike Epstein was, it, 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 he was sure. faking it. No, let's yeah. not take anything away yeah. from Mike Epstein. Yeah. Uh, although look at his stats. Yeah. <laughs> but Greenberg really wanted to be seen as a baseball player. Right. I mean, that was the path to Americanism. Uh, I, I think in many ways he may have been more, even more observant mm -hmm. than Koufax, right. neither of whom were that, they both were really secular right. Jews. And, and DiMaggio was very careful, and Life Magazine, I believe it was, you know, uh, said something about that, uh, unlike most of his kind, he doesn't talk with his <laughs> hands or slurp <laughs> his spaghetti. Yeah. So, I mean, I, these, these guys were up against Right. Terrible uh, racism, and mm -hmm. you know, they were very careful. How much did economic power, I mean, this is one of the things that I think a, a lot of analyses of sports mm -hmm. uh, kind of leave out, where, you know, Muhammad Ali, you can see him as, he, he's a great proxy or kind of personification of changes in racial, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, racial integration and questions about that and uh, kind of assimilation of some degree of blacks into the mainstream of American culture because he did, by dint of winning so many fights and coming back again mm. and again, he became, he's everybody's all-American now in, a, in right. an odd way. Um, but the economic power, I mean, people like uh, Joe Namath, people like Dick Allen, Oscar Robertson, mm. uh, Joe Pepitone even, I mean, these were guys who were able for the first time to really shake off a kind of stultifying economic system where the mm. big team owners and the leagues really, uh, you know, I hate to sound like I'm from the nation, but I mean, where the owners really sucked all of the surplus value out of their players. Right. Uh, and that broke down and that seemed to open things up. Can you talk a little bit about how the, you know, the rise of free agency in sports mirrors, you know, larger shifts in American culture? Well, I think uh, I would go back even a little further, mm -hmm. back to the 60s again. Right. Uh, where the uh, quintessential sport, I think, was tennis. Mm -hmm. Now, tennis players were amateurs for the most right. part. And um, how did they manage to live? Well, they were paid under the table mm -hmm. um, to show up at tournaments uh, to win matches, mm -hmm. um, which kind of kept them in total thrall mm -hmm. to the owners and the officials. Uh, it was really Billie Jean King, more than anybody, mm -hmm. who broke that system and brought us out of amateurism 
into professionalization right. of tennis. And I think that was the first big how break. Did she, how did she manage to do that? By, because by, she's also a trailblazer in other really interesting right, ways as by, well. Uh, by threatening strike. Right. The women wouldn't play. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had very little to lose. They certainly weren't right. even getting paid as much under the table as, as the men that. were. Uh, so th that was an important thing. And, and I think that there are, you know, the, the revolutions start small mm -hmm. and they start regionally. Yeah. And I think this is what happened mm -hmm. in sports. I mean, all of a sudden, everybody else started thinking, you know, I'm really being messed over. Right. Uh, the idea that, you know, the, the team that you signed with as a teenager mm -hmm. owns you for life, right. whether you don't want to live in Philadelphia right. or not. The football players uh, who saw that colleges mm -hmm. were, quote, stacking them, mm -hmm. that uh, the intellectual positions, like you know, quarterback, center, middle linebacker, could only go to white men. Right. Uh, and I think that in baseball, uh, the idea of, you know, uh, this, this plantation system was right. kind of most obvious. Um, so Kirk Flood right. in... Uh, uh, the outfielder Kirk for Flood the Cardinals. Kirk Flood was an outfielder for the St. Louis Cardinals who was uh, traded to Philadelphia right. and didn't want right. to go. Right. And uh, he called himself a $90,000 a year slave, which, of mm -hmm. course, the sports writers all laughed about. Right. $90,000 a year slave. Right. But, of course, he was. Yeah. And I, I think that that resonated with mm. black players. Uh, he lost his case to the Supreme Court. Uh, but eventually, a few years later, it was two mm. white players uh, who were able, through arbitration, to create free and agency. And that was Messerschmitt and uh, Dave yeah. McNally. Talk uh, about Billie Jean King a little bit more, because you, you said that, you know, in a lot of ways, her role in tennis, uh, you know, or, or kind of by threatening mm. to withdraw for, you know, her services, which people wanted to watch, you know, that helped gain, she got some economic power, which changed things. The, elder, the, the ultimate feminist power is to withhold. withhold yeah. right. So she's like the Les Estrada of exactly. tennis. Okay. Exactly. And, and then she emerged later in the 70s. I mean, she had that great spectacle with Bobby Riggs, right. uh, where you know, he was the male chauvinist pig. She beat him in a singles match. And in a lot of ways, that single signaled, if not parity between male and female sports, but uh, athletes, it, it, it said something. Um, and well, it gave enormous impetus to the ultimate enforcement of Title IX. Mm -hmm. uh, so Billie Jean King, besides, yeah. she's my favorite athlete, by right. the way. And I think the most important of my time. Mm -hmm. But you know, not only did she, I think, break open this you know, amateur, this religion right. of amateurism, is the yeah. very dirty part of sports. Uh, but she was representing at least half the population mm -hmm. of the world, right. women. You know, part of taking control of their bodies right. you know, was taking control of their sports possibilities. And then she took it even further because she also took control of her sexuality in a public way of saying, right. okay, well, I'm not, I'm not going to go along. I'm not going to go it. along to get along. And yeah. paid for it. I mean, I, I think that she was in the closet uh, yeah. and she was, she was kind of unfortunately outed in a mm -hmm. uh, palimony case. Right. So, I mean, uh, I think she came out before her time. Right. But nonetheless, and, and that's interesting that she may be more representative or exemplary than even Muhammad Ali oh, in terms of just the great individualization right. of American culture over right. the past 45 years. And I think in many years. ways that was kind of hardcore and real. Mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali really has to do with your feelings mm -hmm. and... Um, mm -hmm the emotional and political sensibilities you attach mm -hmm. to him. Right. Muhammad Ali, again, idiosyncratic and not right. like anybody else, also made people brave. Mm -hmm. I think that was his most important function, was a symbolic function. Mm -hmm. I don't think laws were changed because of him, uh, but I do think that certainly among young black men yeah. who saw this beautiful black man standing up to the man right. uh, among athletes, you know, who when he was, when he refused to step forward and be drafted, mm -hmm. he was immediately uh, barred was from boxing yeah. for three and a half years. Uh, and athletes all over the world saw, well, if they can do that to Muhammad Ali, they can do that to anybody. Mm -hmm. So either we roll over and play dead 
but will we change the system? Right. And athletes being, you know, risk-taking people. The Black Power Salute mm -hmm. in the 68 Olympics uh, came out of a Olympic movement started by the sociologist Harry Edwards that included uh, a number of demands, mm -hmm. some Olympic-based, but one that Muhammad Ali get his license returned mm -hmm. to fight. So it, this was all part of mm -hmm. what was then called the athletic revolution right. and the black athletic revolution, mm -hmm. which failed. Uh, Muhammad Ali has, until very recently, has never made any of, you know, Michael Jordan kind of right. money. Mm -hmm. uh, and the two young men, right. Tommy Smith and John Carlos, uh, were effectively squelched for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but I think yeah. that everybody saw what had happened and uh, a new and stronger generation came out of that. Going a little bit earlier back in the 60s, you co-wrote Dick Gregory, the best known as a comedian, uh, Dick Gregory's uh, provocative, controversial, best-selling autobiography, which he called Nigger. Right. My understanding of it is that he had said, uh, his mother asked him why he would ever name his book that, and he said something along the lines of, you know, if they're going to call it to me, uh, if they're going to call me that anyway, they might as well advertise my book. Right. Um, the opening of that book, and, and what's interesting is that Gregory is in many ways an interesting confluence of a political, of somebody who became a political activist, started out running on a track scholarship at I think University Southern of Southern Illinois, Illinois, yes. Illinois, which is effectively the South. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about your participation in that book and the writing of it, because that opens, uh, and it's, it's somewhat hard to find, and people are reticent to even talk about it because of its uh, title. title yeah. But the opening section of that is this incredible, great um, set piece of black rage, where Gregory actually talks about his upbringing and is particularly mad at his absent father. Can you talk a little bit about how you came to be involved with that project and how how the writing process on that worked? Well, Greg had um, had turned down every other writer in New mm -hmm. York uh, for the project. And uh, so the publisher was scraping the bottom of the barrel, <laughs> and they found this kid on Night yeah. Rewrite again, and uh, sent me over uh, to his hotel room the day after the Birmingham bombings, when mm -hmm. his four little girls were Killed. I got there and I was told that Greg was in another room and couldn't be bothered. <laughs> I was Robert Lipside of the New York Times. Mm. And so I walked in and sat down and here's this man in his underwear blubbering on a bed. And um, he looked up and he began for the next maybe four or five hours, people like you murdering those little girls. So mm. I. I really got four or five hours of that, that mm -hmm. black radio, and I was stunned, mm -hmm. and I listened to it. And I think that was yeah. the beginning uh, of, of our relationship. Uh, my, my father was uh, head of what was called the 600 schools, schools for emotionally disturbed boys, mm -hmm. um, primarily black in New York City, as so I would visit him in schools a lot, and he, was, he, he really, uh, was not a leftist, but he was certainly believed in social justice and, um, and what was happening to what he called the underserved mm -hmm. population. So between my dad and, and Gregory, um, that was a, a white boy's education mm -hmm. in what was really happening mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, so so uh, Greg was a, is a major sports fan. Right. And uh, so we talked sports a lot. Uh, do you think uh, race relations have improved significantly since the, you know, since the 60s? Um, and what was the role of sports in kind of, cre if not changing things, but creating a, a place where people could talk about this? Yeah, I, I think it has, uh, if no other reason. Then until he died a couple of years ago, my closest friend was black, and we never would have really gotten mm -hmm. together or found found ways to make the, you know, uh, uh, initial contact mm -hmm. if it hadn't been for change and for sports mm -hmm. and being able to have this, you know, non-threatening water cooler uh, right. to hang around. I think that um, Jackie Robinson mm -hmm. certainly uh, gave people an opportunity to start learning how to love and hate mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. African Americans individually right. rather than as a group. So it is still okay to hate black players on the Boston Red Sox? Particularly on the yeah. Boston Red Sox. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's because the Red Sox. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, I think that that might be a little racist. Yes. I think you want to hate everybody on the Boston <laughs> Red Sox. Uh, we haven't come oh. anywhere near where, she, where we should be. Mm -hmm. Of course, we've come a long right. way. Is it because of sports? Um, I don't know. I think Harry Truman integrated um, the, the Army right. first. So there were a lot of, and that's very important. Right. Um, certainly, there were, I had Army friends mm -hmm. uh, you know, who, who were close for that yeah. moment. So I, I, I think that, you know, yeah, sure. All mm -hmm. these things have helped, and sports has helped as well. I think sports is also often all sorts of bad values and yeah. ruined a lot of cities. Well, let's, let's talk about that because in, I think it was in 66 or thereabouts, you wrote a book called The Masculine Mystique. Yeah. Uh, and this is a, you know, a kind of fascinating counter, not to feminism, but really kind of an acknowledgement mm -hmm. that there were kind of crusty codes of maleness uh, that have certainly changed you know, uh, enormously. What, what, what it means to be a man now is very different than what it meant in 66, much less in 46 or 1906. Um, how, I'm not sure that that has changed for the better, by the way. Okay, yeah, well, let's talk about that yeah. because, um, you know, among the ways that sports promote bad values, I mean, one is a, uh, and you've written about this, a kind of sense of entitlement. It's very mm -hmm. much where you get to be the prince. Right of the world and you know everything is just for your taking because you're good at hitting a ball mm -hmm. or you know throwing a pass or something like that so talk a bit about the negative well, let's talk impact. about sports okay. and, and the changes in the yeah. 60s uh was kind of the, the the dying sensibility that sports was a crucible of character mm -hmm. that uh it was within sports that boys would become men and, um, and women would become spectators. And women would learn to serve them right. properly. Right. Yeah. Um, that changed. But at the same time, you know, when I was growing up in the 50s, um, a man was somebody, and this goes back to the, the frontier, was somebody who protected um, and provided for his family and other people's little children. Mm -hmm. uh, he was stoic and brave, uh, and uh, he had all these kind of good qualities. Whether he did or not, it didn't matter. Right. That sensibility existed. I don't think that sensibility exists now I mean, with these, these banksters on Wall Street. I mm -hmm. mean, are these men? Jamie Diamond is a man mm -hmm. in this society? You have to be joking. Was uh, John D. Rockefeller a man? No, absolutely no. not. He took advantage of all these people who believed in, you know, this idea of, you know, uh, which never truly existed. I mean, mm -hmm. as we know, right. um, Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett were basically real estate speculators. Mm -hmm. uh, which... Uh I'm not. Th I'm not necessarily against. But I was going to say at least, oh, unlike uh, Jamie, you're trying Diamond, to sell something. Uh, uh, you know, I'm always trying yeah. to sell. If you're not selling, you're <laughs> missing business. But I mean, at least Rockefeller sold cheap oil to people mm -hmm. uh, in a way that Jamie Dimon. It remains to be seen what product right. will save his soul. Well, I'm, I'm yeah. glad that Rockefeller has a yeah. defender. Yes. Oh, very much so. But mm -hmm. uh, and and also one who's not related to him, by mm -hmm. the way, uh, sadly. Uh, it, but then talk about it in terms of sports figures. I mean, because even Babe Ruth, who was obviously a philanderer and in many ways a horrible human being, his public image was that of, you know, kids stay in school, you know, even orphans like me, if you work hard and, you know, Absolutely. keep your nose. Um, and now we have, you know, uh, there's reality shows about cast off NBA, mm -hmm. not even wives necessarily, but baby mamas. Right. Um, has sports fueled that kind of sense of uh, simultaneously male entitlement and uh, total lack well, of sports responsibility? Sports has or? fueled the entire mm -hmm. gilded age uh, yeah. that we live in now. Yeah. Of course, sports is part of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think something happened, right. you know, towards you know the the, the, the dark part of mm -hmm. free agency right. uh, and uh, self ownership among athletes uh, was the enormous. Mm -hmm. commercialization and commodification of sports, where sports suddenly became an entertainment. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Now, sports, yes, was always an entertainment, but it really, you mm -hmm. know, had to have some sort of um, cultural, socio-character mm -hmm. sensibility. You know, uh, we were rooting for our alma maters or right. where we wanted to have gone. Right, right. Or, or something that represented us in some way. Right. Uh, the best example now is the rise of fantasy leagues, mm -hmm. which as reason readers probably know better than anybody, <laughs> uh, is where people pluck right. real players and create their own yeah. teams out of them. Oh, uh, it's like very, Stratomatic come to life. Yes, yeah. very often uh, to gamble on right. or, or for you know, commercial yeah. reasons. Uh, but uh, that's as far away as you can get yeah. uh, from rooting for something that has some meaning. Do you um, uh, do you feel that sports, as it's actually practiced by you know grammar schools and high schools and town leagues, is that a um, has that become a destructive force uh, overall in America? To a large America? extent, yeah. And why I mean, is there that? there are there are really terrific coaches mm -hmm. around on on the youth sport. Uh, I've seen them. There's a positive coaching alliance. Mm -hmm. there, there are really organizations that are trying very mm -hmm. hard to stem this tide. But if you see this pot of gold at the end of the athletic rainbow. Hmm. You, know, you know, some years ago, well, you try really hard uh, to get into a Division I school so you mm -hmm. had a chance at the pros. I think now you try really hard to get into a good peewee league for eight or nine year olds right. or a good elementary or middle school league uh, so you have a chance to advance, mm -hmm. you have kids, you know, hurting themselves. I mean, this this epidemic of uh, brain trauma, which we're seeing mm -hmm. now, you know, it's ridiculous to lay it at the feet of the NFL. Right. It didn't happen there. You know, it happened when the kids were eight or nine and began those little insults yeah. to their brain. Do you assume that football is basically on a death uh, death watch at some time over the future? I mean, it'll almost be like boxing or heavyweight boxing where know. it starts to fade. I don't know. Uh, boxing died because there were uh, no more charismatic mm -hmm. heavyweights. Uh, Although people, it's, did the, I mean, it seems to me also that they shifted into things like mixed martial arts well, and ultimate fighting. For that fighting. reason, yeah. that yeah. reason, because all these, you know, they, they were not going into right. boxing. These college wrestlers yeah. began to go into mm -hmm. mixed martial arts. But I, I think that people love to watch the violence mm -hmm. of football. Uh, and football really is the last bastion of masculinity, faux right. masculinity, yeah. in America. I mean, they're going to be sealed team six sniperettes mm -hmm. before there's going to be you know, <laughs> a female linebacker, right? right? So uh, this is this last chance to watch these mm -hmm. really big guys you know, wail the crap yeah. out of each other. Uh, it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, so is it on its deathbed? It would be on its deathbed if decent parents and grandparents mm -hmm. didn't allow you know, little boys yeah. to become peewees, mm -hmm. didn't allow them to play tackle football until they were 15 or 16, mm -hmm. if ever. Um, and it would be on its deathbed uh, if millions of fans, mm -hmm. you know, were conscious struck right. and say, I, you know, just for my pleasure, I can't watch these winsome boys. So in other words, you're saying it's not on its deathbed at all? How, how many people have uh, said, you know, we've had enough drone strikes? Right. right? Mm. Well, they're getting there. You know, we had a 13-hour filibuster on it, so maybe Rand Paul needs to filibuster well, the NFL. it could happen. <laughs> um, For your 50th anniversary. Yes. You have uh, written in favor of paying college athletes or of rather changing the college system so that maybe you don't have to go, you don't have to waste a couple of years and possible mm -hmm. injuries in a college setting where you're really not getting paid much. Um, talk a little bit about that, and, and why is that so controversial? I, I think it would be uh, a, a death knell uh, mm -hmm. to the football factories, to those uh, institutions mm -hmm. of higher learning that have mortgaged their souls to their stadiums and their teams. Mm -hmm. They found out, and it really works. I mean, Notre Dame yeah. is a beautiful example of a, of a good, of a very good university that's really known. Right for its football team more than for its research facilities or its, its library. I remember once uh, we set up a, a camera 
on the campus near the grotto. <laughs> and, and Can interview. you explain for some of uh, the viewers who are not uh, privileged enough to grow up in a Catholic uh, well, universe what the grotto is? The, the, the grotto is, uh, is it's really a, a religious right. grotto where you can go and pray, but you know, more stunning to a non-Catholic yeah. than that uh, <laughs> is overlooking the stadium is this yeah. giant fresco of Jesus with his arms out, which is known in no, among the cognoscenti right. as Touchdown Jesus. Right. Um, so so we, yeah. we shot a hundred boys walking past, <laughs> and perhaps 98 of them had first heard about Notre Dame watching or listening to games with Dad. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that would explain why the kind of, I guess, you know, people who run Notre Dame and people who went there would be against paying athletes because then, you know, their business model is kind of screwed. But why are so many sports, it seems like many sports writers are against the idea of paying athletes what they actually, you know, some large portion of what they deliver in terms of mm -hmm. spectator value. Where, where does that come from? Well, you'd have to talk to those dummies yourself. Yeah. Um, I, I think that maybe they are still invested mm -hmm. in some sort of, uh, I was going to say 20th, 19th century mm -hmm. model of what sports is about and what they are covering. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think a lot of them, and, and when we talk about sports writers, we're also basically talking about all these people uh, who, and particularly in smaller markets, but anywhere mm -hmm. uh, who are invested in one way or another mm -hmm. uh, in the team, which right. gives them their, their city and right. themselves and their station or their paper, some sort of, quote, major league status, mm -hmm. you know, the, where Michigan State may mm -hmm. be the main employer in town. Uh, at hard times there, we lost right. his job, too. So I, I, I think that that's, you mm -hmm. know, it's that kind of corporate journalism is all mixed into that. Um, you also are rare in um, speaking, uh, not, as, not uncritically, but positively about performance enhancing drugs mm -hmm. and steroids. Um, you yourself, you've talked about and you've written about your battles with cancer and the way in which steroid treatments allow uh, you. I, yeah, I'm a user. Um, and uh, why, uh, why are performance enhancing drugs seen, which have been in sports from the beginning. I mean, you know, there is no Tour de France without mm. enhanced, you know, performance enhancing drugs going back to the first or second year right. of that race. Um, but, you know, now it seems that, you know, the worst thing in the world that an athlete can do, uh, you know, they can train as much as they want, they can lift weights as much as they want, but if they take a mm. pill or shoot something, that's verboten. Where, where is that coming from? Well, you know, it's, it's taking the pill or shooting something that enables them to train right, as right, hard as they sure. want. Uh, I mean, yeah. I could, uh, I've been shooting up for 20 years. Yeah. I still can't crush a fastball. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, I, I guess it's an aspect of control. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the anti-doping wonk mm -hmm. somehow moved in. Uh, you know, it's a way of controlling athletes. I mean, I cannot believe that uh, the NFL, you know, doesn't mm -hmm. paddle on a river of steroids. Right. How could that be? Yeah. You know, so big, so fast, so powerful. Uh, but I, I think that the anti-doping forces or the NFL mm -hmm. or whatever has decided, you know, let's let's not go there. Baseball it didn't really matter that mm -hmm. much. I mean, it doesn't seem as if attendance has dropped as home run home run output seems to have dropped mm -hmm. in in recent years. Do we? desperately need the higher, faster, bigger, mm -hmm. the, the greater bangs, the, the spectaculars that we seem mm -hmm. demanding of these guys, and the owners are demanding right. of their players. And the players mostly are willing to do this. Are you kidding? They'll do anything. Yeah. I mean, on that level, right. number one, they'll do anything to stay up there, yeah. to get up to that level and to stay up mm -hmm. that level. And secondly, I've talked to a lot of players about this. I've never, ever had somebody say, you know, I do it and it's a bad thing and I feel badly about it, mm -hmm. but I wanna stay in the bigs. Right. Nobody sees there's anything wrong with right. this. I mean, uh, you know, you're supposed to have LASIK surgery right. for your eyes. Uh, you're supposed to do all kinds of 
supplements. You're right. supposed to kill yourself in training, uh, sacrifice so many aspects of your personal right. life. Um, what's the big deal? Right. And meanwhile, um, these actors that we love to mm -hmm. hobnob with, you know, they've right. all been fixed. Right. I, you know, body modification is, uh, mm -hmm. is the future, right? Um, do you think people like Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, Barry Bonds, should they be in the Hall of Fame despite, uh, you know, uh, Alex Rodriguez, mm -hmm. despite obviously having used performance-enhancing drugs, uh, at least in some cases in contravention of existing baseball policies? First of all, I don't vote. I was yeah. very grateful to work for the New York Times where you're not allowed <laughs> to vote because that was seen as right. a conflict of interest. Yeah. Um, Second of all, what's the Hall of Fame? What, right. what the Hall of Fame is, is basically an almost 100% jump uh, in the value of your card and of your appearance at mm -hmm. card shows. So um, is it uh, the Nobel Peace Prize? No. Do I care about that? And uh, uh, let's face it, the, let's last talk couple, about yeah, the last couple of people who got it. <laughs> Uh, but so, I mean, the, the Hall of Fame is one of those. Are you arguing that it's kind of one of those last redoubts where people can pretend that you know, kind of politics and meaning doesn't intrude into sports? Yeah, I mean, it's I, like I a, have, it's a boy's I bedroom. Have, I have no opinion. It's a treehouse mm -hmm. that I've not been invited to. Yeah. You've also managed for essentially the entirety of your career to be a, a novelist, particularly a young adult novelist. Your first book, I believe, or first novel was The Contender, which right. came out in the late 60s or mid 60s. Yeah. Um, and is you know, widely read still. You've done other books since then. What got you into writing young adult novels? And uh, you know, what, what, what pleasure do you get from that? And what function uh, do you think that they well, serve? Well, I had always wanted to write fiction. I mean, that, that's what I yeah. started out doing. Um, that's why I became a sports right. writer, because I fiction. <laughs> uh, I've always wanted to write fiction. And one night at a Muhammad mm -hmm. Ali fight, mm -hmm. uh, an old boxing manager told me about three flights of stairs up to his gym that he owned years before, and that someday he would hear the steps of a hesitant kid coming alone at night, and that kid desperately wanted to be somebody. And he would come up these dark stairs because he wanted to be a contender. Right. And I, I, the image just totally inflamed right. me. And then that became a book about a young black kid right. who was struggling between the, the kind of discipline it takes to be a boxer right. and other pursuits. Yeah. And you've written several sequels. And he never became sequels. a really good boxer. Right. But it was that discipline yeah. that turns his life around. And um, I wrote it and... Um, at a time that they were inventing, mm -hmm. Harper and Rowe at that time, mm -hmm. Harper Collins, was inventing this new genre, mm -hmm. young adult fiction. It was linear, it had a 17-year-old right. character, there was no sex in it, I only wrote about what I knew at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they made it into a YA novel, and mm -hmm. um, it, it was right for its time. Right. But what happened was, up until that time, I had been a sports writer for around mm -hmm. 10 years by then, up until that time, I was either a genius or a jerk, mm -hmm. depending on whether sports fans agreed with what I was writing. Mm -hmm. But with this audience, and I went into schools, because uh, I think it was important for some reason, teachers thought it was important for kids to see how it's white. <laughs> the <laughs> protagonist was black. Um, and, and these kids were so open about the characters. They talked about my mm -hmm. characters as if they existed and they argued with me mm -hmm. about things that my, my characters had done. It was an absolutely thrilling experience mm -hmm. uh, to realize that there were these people out there who uh, could appreciate this fiction on that level. Right. I had written old adult fiction with less success. Mm -hmm. uh, and also that you could really kind of reach out and, and touch a kid, and mm -hmm. change a kid. I mean, so um, after that, uh, it, it took a while before I wrote another one, but right. it's, it's been a constant threat. I'm, I still yeah. do it. Um, yeah, talk about One Fat Summer, which uh, some of us uh, are fond of as well. Uh, you know, what was the genesis of that? And give well, us the when I there. when I was thirteen, fourteen years old, I was very fat. I had my own, I tell kids I had my own zip code. Uh, it gets less and less of a laugh. Every That's year. right. Yeah. And um, <laughs> but it was semi autobiographical. 
I, I okay. lied about my age at 14. I had this terrible job uh, cutting grass mm -hmm. from a man's yard. Uh, and in the course of that summer, I lost maybe 40 pounds. I don't mm -hmm. know because I had come to a point where I didn't weigh myself right. anymore. I was afraid I right. was hitting 200 already. Um, and, and I always wanted to write a novel mm -hmm. about that. So for many years I wrote, uh, I was writing, by 14 I was a writer. Would you um, say that a, a theme throughout all of your work is, is one about kind of personal control or self-control? Um, mm. I mean, it's kind of interesting. I hadn't thought about that before, but in many ways, the way you talk about sports, professional sports, but also in some of your fiction, that seems to be a recurring theme, the importance of learning how to discipline yourself. I wrote a, a, a novel which is pretty much banned everywhere called uh, Raider's Night, mm -hmm. a football novel. Uh, primarily banned because it was the dark side of high school mm -hmm. football, and that, this is not a good a good thing to do when someday ESPN might right. have a high school football yeah. channel. Uh, I'm not familiar with that, but what's yeah. the plot of Raiders? Well, the plot is, uh, you know, a, a kid sees the team uh, hazing mm -hmm. somebody into a you know, great, you know, breakdown. Right. And so he's torn between uh, doing what I would have considered the right thing and what would have been best for the team mm -hmm. is, is keeping it suppressed. But the point was that around the country there are these kind of maverick football coaches who mm -hmm. assign this book. And I'll go, anybody who does, I'll yeah. go out there and talk to the team. And what's so interesting in that same idea of you know, kids taking YA fiction seriously right. is the battle on the team between whether or not my hero did Mm -hmm. the realistic thing. Right. And, you know, half the team was like, that is so messed up. You never do that. You take right. care of yourself, man. That's what yeah. sports is all about. They say, no, you know, yeah. you know, you're a captain. You're a stand-up guy. You do the yeah. right thing. You take care of little people. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of thrilling because it, it kind of, I would like to think it's recapitulating some mm -hmm. struggle in our society, but I don't see the good side so much. Right, right. You know, reason loves economics. We like to talk about economics and the way it infuses things that don't, you know, don't present themselves as such. With sports, has, you know, in the past, let's say before free agency, broadly speaking, and this may be simplistic or just wrong, but, you know, the owners basically, they got all the money. Uh, you know, fans paid relatively small prices right. for tickets. The athletes got screwed. The Spectators got what they wanted. The owners got a lot. Um, then with free they agency, they didn't get that much. Okay, Wh who the, the owners. owners? Okay, so. I mean to a large extent, yeah. and now we're talking, you know, yeah. 50s, 60s. Many of those owners uh, had their team as their primary business and source of income. Mm -hmm. That's hardly right. the case now. Right. Uh, the players. Uh, tended to live in the same neighborhood as their middle class right. fans and always had winter, you know, right. off season yeah, yeah, jobs. Yeah. The selling aluminum siding, insurance, right. you know, pressing Beer flesh at casinos. Exactly. Yeah. Um, um, so and, the, and the fans uh, could generally take the whole right. family to a ball game. Now, then after this, I mean, it's clear that, you know, owners make a lot of money with their right. teams and despite. Every year, every NFL team, you know, so, somehow loses money. Every major league team, you know, in any sport loses money, but they do pretty well. The, the athletes do very well. Even the mediocre athletes right. have a collective bargaining agreement that works for them. And the fans get screwed, arguably, in two ways. One is that ticket prices are massively expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and then also as taxpayers, because Absolutely. it includes even people who don't give a shit about sports. Right. Um, is that the way that sports has grown up? Is it this, uh, I mean, like grown into a huge global business that it's really extracting money from taxpayers through various kinds of subsidies? I mean, is, how big a factor is that? In That's an how, enormous factor. Yeah. I mean, the, for, for starters, even if a team loses money, and I would have to see the books. Right. I mean, uh, other than Green Bay, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they're all, you can't see the books right. of, of any football team. Uh, even if it's losing money, uh, what does it do for Domino Pizza, right. you know, which is the main business of the guy who owns the stadium? Mm -hmm. you know, whether it's entertaining people in his box, a larger visibility, mm -hmm. becoming a power 
in his community and being able to ram through that bond issue, mm -hmm. which means that you and I pay for the ballpark mm -hmm. you know, with even more luxury boxes. Uh, yeah, that's what's happening in, in sports, as sports becomes this entertainment conglomerate mm -hmm. with lobbyists. I mean, right. the NFL has lobbyists, mm. and the NFL is a nonprofit corporation. Mm. Uh, that's where sports is, and uh, fans complain, uh, and so they'll watch the games on television, on mm -hmm. ESPN, for which they are paying higher premium mm -hmm. rates to their uh, cable right. server. Is there uh, any way, what's, what's a possible intervention in that so that, uh, just to bring it to a kind of elemental, soft social justice that people who like sports pay for them and people who don't, don't have to pay for them? I think that's fair enough. I mean, I'm less uh, sympathetic with the fact that, you know, it costs you a couple hundred dollars to take your kids mm -hmm. to a ballpark. That's a, that's a choice right. and, and you can have your priorities. Don't, don't go to so much opera. Right. Which is also, by the way, taxpayer subsidized and really expensive. Absolutely, yes. I'm I'm much more concerned with uh, taxpayers subsidizing mm -hmm. ballparks that they may not use. Well, we'll end it there. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Robert Lipsight, the sports writer, uh, soon to be ESPN's next ombudsman, for talking with Reason TV about sports, which means talking about race, class, gender, and politics. Bob, thanks That's very sports. much. Race. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'll have to be interested, yeah. but uh, I, the, the first pass really will come out of the email bag mm -hmm. and see what, what people right. uh, are interested in. That's always dangerous, of course, yeah. because they're mostly complaining about mm -hmm. something. Uh, but maybe there's something to complain about. What are your main areas of interest in contemporary sports uh, kind of culture right now? What, do you, what, are, what well, draws you? I mean, ESPN is Im very important mm -hmm. because for most people, I think it's the main window onto sports and sports culture. And we, we probably agree that sports is important yep. as a definer of values. Right. All the years that I have uh, written witheringly mm -hmm. about ESPN, for which I've also worked, right. I must say, uh, it's, it's been the conflict of interest, wondering how you deal with that interface where you are fiduciary partners in the game, right. and then you are supposedly covering it in any kind of honest journalistic way. How do, how do you think ESPN has been doing? Is this a necessary conflict, um, and are they doing a pretty good job well, of sure, policing Well, sure, it's a necessary themselves? conflict if yeah. they're going to have uh, any kind of journalism presence, right. which is probably a good thing for them to have. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I probably would you know, trash ESPN. Uh, now that they're paying you. A couple you. of weeks from, no, <laughs> no, no. Uh, yeah. What I realize now is that I, all these years, haven't had access. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not giving me subpoena power, as right. far as I know, but I, I believe that anybody at ESPN who doesn't answer my call, it's a guilty plea. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I hope to get to the mm -hmm. bottom of it. I mean, a very good example, in, you know, before my watch, of course, is Jason Collins right. uh, comes out. And okay, and this is the NBA player who is, I guess, the first more or less active player right. in a professional sports league male to come out as gay. Right, and one of their prime NBA reporters, mm -hmm. um, in discussing it a couple of days later, said that uh, homosexuals are walking in open rebellion to God and mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. He's also against uh, premarital sex, right. any kind of sex, right. unless it's between a married man and a woman. The basic question is, was he led into that statement on an ESPN show where he was asked what his personal mm -hmm. views were? Was it a declaration right. and a white paper? Why would that matter? Uh, I think it would matter um, a lot. Yeah. I don't know, uh, certainly in, in any kind of standards mm -hmm. and practices, does a reporter Mm -hmm. uh, have the privilege mm -hmm. uh, of an opinion about something that we expect he's covering, whatever right. objectively means. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it would matter. If and, he was a columnist, right. it wouldn't matter. 
in trying to kind of speak to a broad audience of sports goers, should they have people who think that homosexuality is against God's will? Because that would reflect part of their As long as they're or, broadcasting in America yeah. and a big chunk right. of the population feels that way, you bet. Yeah. Freedom of speech, and I mm -hmm. think you know, people have a right to be wrong. Right. Uh, but um, the question is, within a journalistic construct, right. is that appropriate? And so you've talked about, I mean, this partly uh, you're, you're going to try and bring more transparency. I mean, that's the role of the I, I, too. I consider myself the window washer. Yeah. With ESPN as a kind of institution, do you feel, it, I always thought that in a way, I mean, early on especially, it seemed snarky, um, but that was very different and it was very refreshing in sports coverage because for a long time, I think you and a number of uh, other people were different than kind of typical sports mm -hmm. writers in that they brought some edge and some critical distance or some irony to the games or in the industries that they covered. Yeah. Do you think overall ESPN has been a positive influence on the way that we talk about well, sports? Well, you're talking about a very specific time in mm -hmm. ESPN's career when it wasn't ESPN. Right. Now we're talking about Keith Olbermann mm -hmm. and Dan Patrick in particular, right. uh, who had their own uh, Sports Center show. Right. Uh, and they had not been told that irony was over, right, uh, right. nor sarcasm or right. parody or anything like that. And they were refreshing, yeah. uh, and certainly compared to you know, most of the ex-jock, blow-haired guys on yeah. television, they were wonderful. Um, ESPN ultimately, I think, became uncomfortable with that as they became more institutionalized, right. uh, as they got into bed with the leagues. And ultimately, as we know yeah. now, um, they are probably the main uh, mm -hmm. donors for ABC and Disney. Right. So um, that no longer exists. Mm -hmm. uh, was ESPN a positive force? Well, let's take a step back. Mm -hmm. Is sports a positive mm -hmm. force in America? Sometimes it is and sometimes right. it's not. Uh, I guess a lot of the sports that ESPN and the other networks cover uh, is, is not a positive force right. any more than any other kind of entertainment. Right. This is two levels of sports in America. Mm -hmm. One is, of course, celebrity sports, and the other is uh, what you do with your body in public. Right. Uh, where do you go now for good sports writing? What, what are your favorite uh, writers or places, sites? I, I think that there's more good sports writing mm -hmm. than there's ever been, more smart, intelligent people. The only person, however, who I never fail to read is Dave Zirin. Mm -hmm. I think that he's brought something absolutely new and fresh and to sports writing. And he is the, uh, bizarrely, he is, the sports editor of the uh, well, he's of more, the nation. Of the nation, so, yeah. Right. I mean, so, that's well, what do you like? What What's he bringing that well, is? Well, every, uh, everything uh, is politically based. Right. I don't, I, he, he covers nothing without giving us its uh, its political right. ramifications and antecedents. And, uh, in, in that sense, I think he could be seen as a kind of protege of you or an epigon of, of yours. I would like to think yeah. so. Well, um, because he's, this... He's much smarter and stronger <laughs> in, in those areas than I ever yeah. was. But I, I would like to take a piece yeah. of Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that you did early on in a way that was kind of unannounced uh, and thankfully gained a wide mm -hmm. readership, but that you, you were talking before about sports, uh, you know, has multiple levels, but you didn't treat sports as a world unto itself. It's really important as a kind of reflector of a... He wasn't there yet, but the Beatles were mm -hmm. looking for a photo op. And I think that day in February 1964 was really... Run. Me, the Beatles, and Cassius Clay. <laughs> that was the beginning of the 60s. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Robert Lipsight. He's a legendary, widely acclaimed sports writer, novelist, and now he's going to be ESPN's new ombudsman. Uh, come June 1st. Bob, thanks for talking to us. My pleasure. Uh, you know, As an I, old Reason subscriber, <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. I wrote recently when I read about you becoming mm. C, uh, ESPN's ombudsman that uh, chances are people have read something that mm. you've written, whether they like sports or hate sports, because uh, you know, for the past 45 or 50 years, I mean, you've been writing really insightful and wide-ranging essays about sports, young mm. adult novels. My personal favorite is The Contender, which I was forced to read 
and it was one of those books that made me understand required reading isn't always terrible. Other people love One Fat Summer. Uh, let's talk first about um, ESPN. Your role as ombudsman. What will you be? Uh, what will you be doing? Well, that's a very good question. Any suggestions yeah. you have oh. are, are welcome. Uh, I'm the fifth one. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone before has done it entirely differently. I suspect that I will do it the same way I, I wrote sports columns and city columns. It'd do some reporting and then out of that emerges a right. take. Now, will you be taking cues? I mean, will it be your interest or will it be reader interest? Well, ultimately, uh, 